After 10 years of preaching, I'm tired, so I took two weeks off in a row. Um, I didn't. I'm not tired. I never get tired of talking, and you know that. But I am, I am really excited to have Mike Reber uh, sharing God's Word with us this morning. Mike's been a steadfast and faithful friend to me for 10 years, and um, God's done a lot of work in his life. And I know that as he stands before you this morning, he's going to pour his heart out. One thing, as I've done a little bit of uh, working with him on preaching, uh, is the one thing I don't have to do is say, Mike, speak from your heart, because I don't think that he has any other way or uh, capabilities of speaking other than right from his heart. So we're excited to have him. We've or we ordained him a month or two ago. I forgot now, but uh, this will be his first message, uh, and I wanted it to be in our home pulpit. Now, we don't really have a pulpit, but in your home table, your home table. Come on up here. All right. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Did you turn me on? Okay. I'm robotic today. I um, thank you all for being here, coming to my church. I hope that many of you that are members would say the same thing. That this is your church and lay claim to that. Um, Covenant Baptist Church came into my life about 30 years ago. I've been a member here for 28 years almost. Um, there's a lot of people here here just because I'm standing up here and I really appreciate that. It's a, a blessing. There's been a lot of prayers given up for me today, for all of you so that you survive it. Um, this is a family, and that, that's kind of the surprise I've uh, found out over the last 30 years what that really is. It's not a building. We could do this anywhere, but this is a family, and um, I would stand here and admonish all of you to go through the highs and the lows with the family and stick it out because there's a huge blessing in getting to stand up and say 28 years. Um, so I, I hope that's a blessing that comes all your all way. Now when Casey said he was going to introduce me, I thought he was going to give me a little bit of a, of a I don't know what you would call it, but but say it's okay that Mike's eyes leak. It's not, you know. I could, I could do this. I, he's done it before, so that's kind of what I thought. But, but um, this is from my heart. So, um, you know, the church is family. It's God's family. We're children of God. Um, before there was anything, there was God. And he was perfectly happy. Had nothing that he was wanting for, nothing that he lacked. He had complete, fulfilling relationship in his trinity. His omniscient, infinite trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit. He had all the treasure of relationship that you could imagine. But he imagined more. So he created everything so that his treasure and relationship can grow and that's what's going on today is he is calling people to himself into a holy relationship that he makes happen and we get to go along for the ride and enjoy this and be blessed by it so that's what church is it's all about relationship um, I want to thank the pastor for giving me this opportunity. There's been really about 15 or some number of years like that that people have talked to me in this body of people 
some here today, some that are not here anymore today, but they've encouraged me to go this way. And um, I got to say, I've dragged my feet quite a bit because I've always looked at myself as the sow's ear that somebody's trying to make a purse out of this real hard thing. But um, I appreciate pastor's um, faith in me, and, and I really appreciate Tom because <laughs> he's, he's, he, he is right on ball. Um, so I want you to all enjoy me in prayer, please. Father, please bless us as we worship you today. Please use me, Father, to speak your love to these people. May our time now truly bring you glory. May make me speak plain and simple in a way that everyone has ears that can hear. They get your message. Make the message bold so that the enemy knows to retreat now. And your spirit in every heart here transforms as all you're doing is making us a likeness of your son. Give me words, your grace, love, and mercy so that we all know it's your message. Thank you, Lord. Thy will be done. Amen. Well, what do you do when you're going to preach your first sermon? What do you pick? I thought it... Well, I, I didn't even think of it, really. I, I, last Sunday afternoon, Casey called me up and invited me to do this. And I said, sure thing, you bet. Yes, yes, thanks for the honor. Thanks, thanks for the encouragement. I'm all in. And then the rest of Sunday, I thought a zillion different thoughts about what would I talk about. And then um, when I went to bed Sunday night, I did what I thought I would always do if this uh, came around, and I prayed, and I asked the Father for a word that he wanted to speak. And um, early in the morning, Monday morning, kind of waking up in a, I mean, I was dreaming, and I wasn't dreaming. It was one of those deals where God was talking to me, and I got that word, and it was embarrassment. And I thought, well, that's about perfect. Take, take this on for the first time and talk to people about being embarrassed. <laughs> so, in, in line with that, I just being bold and brave, I, I wore a white shirt, even though I drink coffee. <laughs> and, um, and here we go. Um, embarrassment is just a really challenging thing. It is at the core of our self-centered problem. Embarrassment is all about the self. And that's where our enemy really likes to mess with us. Um, Is embarrassments like me in the third grade. I was in Mrs. Cook's third grade class at Highland Park Central Elementary School, and I had this really different teacher, and our third grade class continued to do things that the other third grade classes didn't do. And one of the things she designed for us to do was put on a play in the third grade in the classroom, and the audience would be our parents. And so, eight-year-old boys aren't really into plays. But, um, so we're going to do this play, and, and she announces what the, the play is going to be. It's going to be Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> it could have been Mutiny on the Bounty. It could have been Daniel Boone. It was Sleeping Beauty. And I didn't know how theatrics worked. 
Nowadays, I understand that usually when there's a play, you have tryouts for parts. But Mrs. Cook didn't do it that way. She assigned parts. And I don't, have, I don't think you'll have to guess very much who got Prince Charming. <laughs> she was lousy at typecasting. I was the skinniest, least athletic guy in the class. I was the only third grader wearing glasses at the time. I, I felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb. I didn't feel charming. I certainly didn't feel princely. I did know enough about the story about Sleeping Beauty that this guy was really going to be under the, under the gun. <laughs> so I absolutely contemplated running away and joining a circus. <laughs> I, I complained to my parents. I complained to everybody to no avail. I really didn't complain too much to Mrs. Cook. There wasn't any sense in that. So um, I had all kinds of self-centered feelings about being embarrassed in this situation. But that's the way it was. And I had to deal with that. The, the circus loomed large in my thinking. In God's story, Embarrassment comes up pretty quick. He's had a fast week, and he's created everything. Adam and Eve are on the ground, and they're getting used to the garden. They've been walking through the garden with God. He shows up on a regular basis, spends time with them. And then you all know how that story goes. The enemy shows up looking like a snake, suggests things to him that really shows you how much he understands our self-centered situation. And um, they made a decision that changed them and changed everything. And the next thing you know, you're in Genesis... Um, Three, and I've got it written down, but I started not looking at my page. Um, Genesis 3, and Adam believes that God is coming against him, and he's hiding in shame. Now, shame's a type of embarrassment. It is a solitary feeling where... Um, Nobody you think has discovered this yet, so you're hiding in shame. The embarrassment will be as if you're found out. So Adam thinks God's coming against him, and he hides. When God came to the garden and found Adam and Eve, Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was, a, I was naked. I hid myself. Now, sin had shown up first, but you see how embarrassment harbored that situation and added to it? Thoughts and actions to not trust and obey hide embarrassment and deepen the problem. That is what this message is going to be. Just try, I'm going to try and help us with a thought process about what happens when we choose to be embarrassed. Here are some of the ways that embarrassment deepens our problems. Christianity is a faith that is based on a relationship with God. It is all about relationship. A religion is a practice. We practice spiritual disciplines to help us with our relationship, okay? But religion is often no more than a system of keeping people in line. And religions, other religions in this world, that's exactly what they're doing. Is they've got a system in which they plan to keep the culture in line. And everybody behaves.
if you look at your Bible and look at all the stories, you got to say that God cares a lot more about these relationships than he does our behavior. The whole deal is a relationship with him. Religion is that kind of thing that tries to control people. It makes people pretty miserable, and they fall out of line all the time, and they feel trashed. The threat of embarrassment is a religious tool. Now, it's the threat of embarrassment, okay? Such as, you don't want to get caught at the pearly gates with your neighbor standing next to you with a, two, with a brimstone scorched finger pointing at you saying you never told him about Jesus. That's the kind of message that religions, religious stuff would use to manipulate you into behaving the way they want you to. Instead of telling people about Jesus because you love them they turn it around and make it so you're going to love yourself. You see? Embarrassment can dim the lamp post of our faith. We do mess up. Everybody knows we mess up. God's plan is to fix the mess. So why try to hide it? Everybody knows we mess up. Think of the politicians and how they run and hide in, in embarrassment on different issues because the strongest motivator of that system is behavior and having the right kind of appearance and everything. So embarrassment's used tremendously in that realm. Everybody knows we mess up. Christians know about grace. Does your neighbor know that you know about grace? Or does he see you embarrassed hiding your flaws? For some people might know that the, the whole neighborhood hears the yelling and screaming coming from your house. Do you talk to your neighbor about going to a Christian uh, marriage counselor? You, are you up front with him and tell him that you're, you know you got problems, you know you got a mess, but you're looking to God's people to help you? Or do you just push it under the carpet and let that be your witness as a Christian that you hide in shame? You're embarrassed. What does he think about how you handle your mess? and how your mess handles you. Parents have children. And I've, I've man, I've got five daughters. I've, I've, I've rode the r crazy ride. And, um, and all kinds of stuff happens in a family. There's messes. What is a parent teaching a child that messes up and the parental reaction is to be embarrassed and to want to hide things. Hide the misstep to your child, how does that sound? Is the misstep the misstep or is the child the misstep? Is it possible that we can teach our children that they are an embarrassment when we hide what they have done or are doing? Should your children have ever let you know what's going on? And in the future, if that's their experience that they, because my kids, I think all kids, they don't want to embarrass mom and dad. They actually love us. And they have their self-centered situations too. But in our maturity, we're supposed to be able to help them with that. Hiding in embarrassment, that self-centered feeling can bring us the results 
far from our desire to not trust and obey that the truth sets us free. There's not going to be any peace and rest in that. That is exactly where the enemy wants us to be, is fearful and not trusting. God wants us to trust and obey because we need to. It is for us. There's a young lady in the room right here. And she's the only one that will remember this if she remembers this. But years ago, she was asking about why we had these laws on us. Why, why the Ten Commandments? Why? Why? You know? And I told her, I said, the law is not against us. The law is for us. It's where the happy life is. We really believe that? In the book of Mark, there's a story about a really nasty king named Herod. Herod, to me, is kind of one of the weirdest sickest guys in the whole Bible. He, he does some, he has, whenever I see a story in the Bible about Herod, you can just kind of see a, a guy that's got Satan just crawling all through him, you know. He's, he's doing every kind of sick thing that you can imagine. And so, Herod, Herod really was full of his self-centeredness to the max. And he like to go around being the king, you know? And so he has this party. He invites all the big shots from the community to this party. And um, everybody, you know, he's sitting at the head of the table, obviously, or however they arranged things in those days, but he was in the spot. And all the big shots were around there, you know? And he has his own daughter come in and dance for the big shots. Now, the Bible doesn't exactly say that her dance was any kind of particular kind of dance, but the whole atmosphere of everything made me feel like her dance had a less than positive, a weird, sick type of effect on the crowd. And they loved her. And they just made a big deal to Herod about how wonderful his daughter's dance was and everything which just pumped up Herod's pride and his self-centeredness. And he's really feeling the moment. And so he stands up and he makes a promise and an oath. And he tells the daughter that she can have any gift she wants out of his kingdom. It's hers. Well, he's being a big shot. She's being a little bit thoughtful. She goes talks to her mom about how to milk this promise for the best. Uh, this gift is going to be the gift. What, mom? What, what do I want? You know, let's, let's get everything out of this we can. And so she comes back to Herod, and she tells him that she wants the head of John the Baptist. That was not anything he had expected. Herod liked having John the Baptist around. He was kind of like a number one prize prisoner, for one thing. He really had a top dog prisoner. John the Baptist said things that were interesting, and he couldn't figure him out exactly. And John the Baptist might have something to do with God, and that kind of had Herod a little bit scared sometimes. But in Mark 6, 26 and 27, he said, Though the king was deeply distressed, because of his oaths and the guests, he did not want to refuse her. The king sent immediately for an executioner and commanded him to bring John's head. So he went and beheaded him in prison. Now, 
And that's one of the most stark examples of what we do when we dance around trying to not be embarrassed. Where, where our self-centeredness not only operates with the mess we've got, but it makes a bigger mess. It's a real good question. Whose deceit have we fallen into when we use embarrassment as a shield or an excuse? How are we going to get out of this mess, this embarrassment mess? Well, let's go back to the beginning. That's where the Father shows up, and he cares most about them, not the mess. Genesis 3.21, the Lord God made clothing out of skins for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. God, God shed the first blood ever spilled on planet Earth for those skins to cover their nakedness. The consequences of the original sin still had their effect. And to save them from more harm, he kicks them out of the garden. The relationship changed. And the story of a father wooing a rebellious bunch of children back to himself began. There are many more chapters in this story of God helping us with this mess of embarrassment. We hear Pastor Casey all the time talking to us about being disciples. That means that we're submitting ourselves to become like Christ, to study God's word, to pray to God, talk to God, become relational with God. And with the, with the ever-present moment-to-moment thought that his spirit is in us and we're supposed to not do our will, but let his will do the living of our lives. And so we get pictures of this guy that we're supposed to be becoming like, okay? So many times I have remember back and I remember Sunday school class and things and we, we studied what Jesus did. And as I look back so often times, it wasn't honed in that now we're supposed to be like this guy. It's not just that he is God. It's also that we have God in us. So Jesus meets this woman at the well. He's a Jewish rabbi, a Jewish guy, and she's a Samaritan woman. And she, he's at the well by himself, and she comes by herself because she's a woman that lived in embarrassment and in shame. Because, as Jesus would tell her, he knows her well and surprises her with that. She knows she's been married a bunch of times, and she's living with a guy right now she's not even married to. That's why she's at the well by herself, because she's an outcast in her community. Now, she's also a Samaritan woman, which meant that she wasn't of the group of, of that... Jesus was a, a Jewish guy, you know? So there was that difference between him and her. He's holy, perfect, and she's a mess. And he talks to her about giving her living water. And he loves her just where she's at. And let her know he knows exactly where she's at. And he loves her. And she goes back to the village, a changed person with lots to say. Can we be like Jesus and meet people in their mess so that they can learn that when they're talking to a Christian brother and sister, 
they don't need to be worried about being embarrassed because they're going to be giving living water. They're going to be given love, grace, and mercy because they've met a person with Jesus inside them. There's another story where a bunch of religious hotshots were getting ready to pick up st stones and murder this woman because she'd been, she's a married woman and she'd been caught in infidelity. And so there's a double trap going on here, kind of. I mean, they're looking to kill her, but they're also looking to trap Jesus into not obeying the law and everything, you know, because the law said that somebody did this, he stoned. But again, Jesus didn't care so much about her mess. He cared about her. And so he does that drawing in the dirt that everybody's wanted for a couple thousand years what he drew in the dirt. And um, he completely befuddles the hot shots that were going to throw stones when he told them whoever has not sinned, you go ahead and throw the first stone. And the only guy there was sitting there that could do that would have been him. The bad guys, and they were, yeah, you can see, they were the bad guys. They were the religious guys that used religion to make people perform, motivate them to do things right, behavior control. And they all walk away. And G Jesus says um, something like, Who's, where's, your, where's your accusers? And they weren't there. There weren't any there. She's really humbled. He tells her, go and sin no more. And he just loved her. There's another example of how we're supposed to be when we find somebody in a mess. We don't look for sticks and stones. We, um, we love them. And we offer them our Jesus, I hope. Boy, this is going to be a problem. It is a problem. So, I might get a chance to project. No, it's going to come on. Okay. And so, one of these things is, I mean, the thing is, Christianity is a relationship, us and God. Christianity is an operation where we are being fitted for that holy relationship as the spirit that's in us transforms us into a likeness of God, a likeness of Jesus. I can only imagine how much fear there is in this room when they think about trying to walk away from hiding and how they're they don't want to deal with embarrassment quite this way and that's going to how we do that is going to be an awful lot about how we operate as a family is this a family that will help brothers and sisters in spite of their mess and love them. Now, I'll say yes, because Mike Reber hasn't been here all these decades without this family loving me through some messes. Okay? And other people here have been loved through messes. One large group I'll talk about is divorced people. 
because I came to this place because I was marrying a charter member of this church. I first started visiting this place because I watched her dad die of cancer while we were dating. And so that brought this unchurched guy that hadn't had anything to do with church for a long time into this church. And I saw people that were pretty weird. Because <laughs> they seemed to be changed. They seemed to be different. They handled messes differently than what I expected. I'll never forget the night I watched her dad die. I was just a bumpkin dating a gal. I knew her dad had cancer. And we came home for a date one night. And her neighbor at her apartment was waiting on the porch for us to get home because the message was, you got to get to the hospital right away because your dad's going to die tonight. And you need to get there and say goodbye. We had not been dating that long. And I could have dropped her off. But God did me a favor and sent me to the hospital with her. And I get into this room at Stormont Vale. It's dimly lit. There's only a light above the bed of the guy that's sick as dog. And... Um, and he's in a miserable situation, dying of lung cancer. And um, he'd already been through esophageal cancer and had one of those trachs in his throat, but it had not stopped the cancer. It got in his lungs, it's killing him. And I get there, and there's about a dozen people in a string of chairs L-shaped around the edge of the room. And they're a very somber bunch. And... Uh, My girlfriend goes up and talks to her dad, and her mom's there, and she's bawling, and daughter starts bawling, and son's over there in a corner, and he's got tears running down his face, and there's tears for a lot of folks that are in that L-shaped sitting arrangement. And uh, then this crazy guy showed up, smiling, slapping people on the back, shaking their hands. How you doing? What's going on? It's a great night. He walks up to this man in the bed, Paul, whom is on his last lap going home to the Lord. And he goes, how's it going, Paul? He goes, I hear you're going to get to beat me to meet in Jesus tonight. And he talked to that man like victory was at hand and he changed that room and everybody started smiling in spite of their microphones <laughs> and um, <laughs> and I thought I literally thought I'd watch some kind of miracle thing because these folks were miserable. This guy was dying. I won't go into it. It was an ugly physical death. A few years later, that same guy's given me um, marriage, premarital counseling. Because her and I are going to get married. So we went through that and and he was a wonderful pastor. And I've had, honestly, I've had too many wonderful pastors here. This guy stays. <laughs> um, about a handful of years later, I've got a mess. And um, my wife doesn't want to be married anymore to me. And I'm going to get divorced. And in the six years that had gone between the two of the wedding and this time, I'd really got hooked up here. And I'd found a, 
a whole new way of looking at life. But there's a lot of embarrassment that goes with divorce. There's a lot of stuff. And there was um, X amount of somebody should be leaving this church. And I had a different pastor <coughs> come to me and said, don't leave. Stick it out. I'll be with you. And with that, that help, I stuck it out. And then, by the grace of God, just a few months later, a pastor comes and gathers up four of us, I think it was, hands us this box of VHS tapes and some workbooks and stuff, and says, this is divorce care. It's a new thing. Why don't you guys look at that and see if it's anything we should do here? That ministry still goes on today here. I don't know if anybody's kept track of the dozens and dozens and dozens of lives it's helped. But it's Jesus loving people in their mess. And so um, that's what we need to be. That's, that's how we're going to overcome this embarrassment situation is we're going to be Jesus for each other. He'll show up and rescue you from your embarrassment, just like he did for me in the third grade. It's showtime. And um, I'm Prince Charming. Freckled faced Linda is laying on the teacher's desk. She's sound asleep. <laughs> My last line was said, and I was standing at the edge of that desk. And the thought process went through my mind to start bending at my waist to lean into her, and she shot up like a jackrabbit. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> and so, to me, I'm really glad I didn't grow up in a circus. God, as far as I'm concerned, he was there for an eight-year-old, you know, two of us probably, because I mean, obviously she had some thoughts too. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, we really felt saved. <laughs> I want to thank you all. I want to end this with a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for meeting us and loving us in our mess. I pray that all of us will die to our self-centered ways and let you do the living in us. Help us have strength against our enemy who wants us chained to the law and embarrassed to make it all the worse when we fall. Let us only value your opinion of us your children who were bought with the price of your only begotten son's blood on a cross. Thank you for the love letter that is your holy word, wooing us back into a loving relationship that is the reason for everything that was ever created. We love you in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>